when I found out that Beyonce's Lemonade had some elements of Daughters of the Dust. My website shut down, and then I started getting all these phone calls and emails, have you seen it? People started asking me, Did, uh, were you offended or anything? I was like, no, <laughs> are you kidding? Hi Vogue, I'm Julie Dash, and I'm here to talk to you about my film, Daughters of the Dust. I started studying film during the black exploitation period. When I was in high school, let's say, I started going to the Studio Museum of Harlem and studying cinematography. Later, when I was in undergraduate school at CCNY, a pilot program called the Leonard Davis Center for the Performing Arts was started, so I decided uh, to change my major and major in film. I relocated out to Los Angeles. I wrote uh, and directed a film called Illusions I in 1982. I, I did another film, short film called For Women. But all the time I'd been writing and perfecting and making a trailer for Daughters of the Dust and then eventually we were able to raise uh, $800,000. Nana, she carried them with her for generations. Daughters of the Dust is about an African-American family, uh, about the women who are the carriers of their traditions and belief, and it's uh, a family dinner that takes place uh, the night before they migrate north. I was very much uh, excited by the opportunity to depict African-American women or women from the African diaspora in a way that was different from what I was seeing on television at the time or what I was seeing in the, in the movies with the black exploitation films. I always felt that other, the stories of others were told with such elegance and grace, and our stories were just kind of like brutal. And so I was determined to reimagine how we are on the screen in historical drama as well as contemporary life in a way that uh, that it showed respect for my family and for the community from which I came. You know. Costumes were very, very particular for me. And one of the things that we did with the costumes, what I wanted was to have the costumes indicate to the viewer the time period and where these women were in their lives and how the, this family functioned on this island. So I made sure that all of the costumes were uh, 10 to 15 years older than the 1902 time period in which it's set. They were like Gibson girl white dresses, but if you know anything about the Gibson girl dresses, they were hand-me-downs in the late 1800s. Gibson girl dress was just something that was fashionable in, in, in Sears catalogs. So then you know that there was some contact with the outside world, with wealthier families who handed these things down and, and, and these women wore it on special days. It was also important for me to show that uh, African Americans are not always wearing uh, the same old, the, the clothing that they wear when they're doing agricultural work, because that, that's usually what we see. It was also important that I indicate that the Nana Pazant, the family matriarch, that she's not wearing one of these white dresses. She's wearing a dress uh, that's dyed in indigo blue, specifically because that was the, um, the cash crop that they worked on when, when she was growing up. Color indigo uh, was it's very important and remains very important to the Gullah Geechee people because it was not only a cash crop in the uh, colonies, it was also technology and agriculture that they brought with them from West Africa, the process, the planting, harvesting, and, and processing of indigo. And so that's something that you, you we still see today uh, painted on the windows and and, and framing houses the color indigo. It's just very special and very powerful, very magical. The wardrobe team, um, they were fantastic. Uh, we had several things that were built in Savannah, like Yellow Mary's uh, dress was made, handmade in Savannah. The most important thing about the costumes were we had to age them 
because it's very difficult to shoot white on black skin tones and we didn't want that contrast out there, especially because the, uh, the sun was so bright and the sand was so bright white and w with the bright white tresses, it would have been, you know, catastrophic. So everything was like dipped in, they call it dipped in tea, but really was dipped in dye <laughs> to bring down the whiteness and make it appear more aesthetically pleasing to the eye um, on the dark skin tones. Between myself and Carrie James Marshall, who was our production designer. We worked very hard on establishing a look, creating a world that was unlike any world that uh, had been seen before on the screen. The costumes were from actual photographs that were held at the Penn Center. Photographs of women in white dresses uh, having lunch on the beach. Uh, they also wore hats, but we could not afford the hats. <laughs> we ran out of money. <laughs> We submitted to Sundance and uh, they accepted it. It was in the competition. We won for best cinematography. And we assumed that we would get distribution right away, uh, but we did not get distribution. It wasn't until one year later. And it was released to theaters in 1992. It just never occurred to me until someone said, well, you're the first black woman to get a major theatrical release. It was kind of bittersweet because it was like, this is 1992. There were some uh, distributors who, who didn't even want to talk about it. They wanted to see what they normally see, you know, in black people in situations and in locations where they were recognizable from previous films. And at the time, um, you know, uh, black youth films, you know, male or dominated youth films were being made and they wanted to see something more hip hop. And I was actually told by, you know, one distributor that my film was not authentic like the other films were. In terms of um, depicting African Americans on the screen, it was mostly um, stories about antebellum slavery period and all of that, or the, what I call the urban testosterone films. We had this hunger, you know, uh, to see ourselves uh, as complicated people living our lives and everything didn't have to do with racial oppression or civil rights. I did not know the way I was dressing the characters in Daughters of the Dust would be surprising or shocking to most. Some people would say were just absolutely offended. Daily Variety said that um, it looked like a Laura Ashley commercial because of the white dresses and then that's right there. You could just see the that's the biased attitude. It's like why if you're thinking of having um, black women depicted at the turn of the century, they have no right to be wearing a white dress blowing in the wind and the sand. They need to have, a, you know, a pitchfork and a hoe. They were saying, you know, like, black people don't wear white dresses like that. You know, why, why didn't they have on a player dress or something? Uh, and, and that just goes to show you that um, we see so much of the same thing over and over in television and in motion pictures. Not so much now as it was 30 years ago. Daughters of the Dust has had a long <laughs> life. And so I'm very happy, we're all very happy about that. I've had a lot of comments from a lot of young filmmakers who say, you know, it was one of the first black films that they've seen like that, that even though they didn't understand it, they can't get it out of their mind. When I found out that Beyonce's Lemonade had some elements of Daughters of the Dust, my website shut down. And then I started getting all these phone calls and emails, have you seen it? And at that time, I had to get a link. Like I was in awe, it was beautiful. I just watched it, my mouth was open agape and I was just watched this whole thing for 40 minutes. It was like, my heart was beating so hard, it was so good. Um, and then the interesting thing was, then people started asking me, Did, uh, were you offended or anything? It was like, no, <laughs> are you kidding? I went to art school. <laughs> we don't get, with that, we, we love stuff like that. It's like, you know, next generation takes your stuff and repurposes it. And that's, that's the whole meaning of telling stories. There's a continuum of ideas that build uh, on projects. There's nothing that's like totally 
totally original. And I've told people many times that my tree scene was a homage to Ganja and Hess. With Dr. Hess is sitting in a leg swinging. I've been influenced and informed by other pieces of artwork that kind of speak to that time period. I think Daughters of Dust has had, had the impact that it's had because it's different, because it went beyond uh, the comfort zone of most, because it introduced Gullah Geechee culture to the mainstream African-American culture, because we dared to, to light it in a certain way, AJ's lighting, because Kerry James Marshall's uh, production design was so authentic and confounding, and the music of John Barnes. So I, I think it was a combination of all of these things that make it, still make it kind of uh, an interesting film to, uh, to look back at.